you need a, a mix of types of caregivers to go along with that gross graduated levels of care that people need. Many of the needs are companionship. This is where platforms like Care Yaya come in, where you're providing that companion care. You're filling this great need. And so I applaud y'all. Welcome to the future of caregiving. The podcast where tomorrow's care meets today's voices. Dr. Alexis, Senator Gail is a board certified neuropsychologist, over 20,000 patients, award winning Alzheimer's, and English palliative care physician at Mass General Hospital. Join us as we explore how innovation and compassion are reshaping caregiving's landscape. Today, we are joined by the one and only Senator Gail Adcock. Not only does she represent the 16th District in the North Carolina Senate, but she has also been a family nurse practitioner for 37 years and has experience as a registered nurse in a nursing home and as a public health nurse providing in-home care. Well, Senator Adcock, welcome to the Future of Caregiving. Thank you so much for inviting me. Uh, you're one of the most interesting guests we've had so far, ranging uh, in background from being a family nurse practitioner to practice of healthcare, corporate healthcare, and now in the government. First of all, I'd like to kick it off. Congratulations. What is it like to be the first nurse ever in the North Carolina Senate? Uh, it's awesome. It's not lost on me every day. What a unique experience I'm getting to have. There are 10 million people in the state. There are 50 senators and there's one nurse. So when I do that math, it blows my mind and it makes me very happy and it makes me very grateful, even on a bad day. Great. You know, your background is really interesting in that you've been a family nurse practitioner for 37 years. And most recently, before entering government, you were chief health officer of SAS for over 26 years. What was it like managing primary care for 14,000 people in a company? Oh, it was it was the most wonderful quarter decade. I uh, was the chief health officer, as you said, for SAS. And, and how that really happened was through a wonderful multidisciplinary team of 68 individuals that actually delivered services through our on-site healthcare center at SAS. And um, I just happened to get to be the quarterback for that team for, for 26 years. And it was one of the most rewarding experiences of my life. And I, I think I can speak for those 68 people that I worked with until about three years ago who would say the same thing because uh, the SAS environment, it puts great value. In fact, the highest value um, believes that its greatest asset is its people. And so therefore, when you believe that, you invest in your people. And that means you invest in them in a lot of ways. You give them meaningful work to do. You get out of their way so they can do it. You reward them with a great culture and a great environment in which to go to work. And in the healthcare space that we were in, they let the relationship with their patients drive the services. We managed to do all that to keep our employees and their family members because among that 14,000 were about 5,500 or so employees and the remainder were dependents. From as young as babies born yesterday to people in their 80s. And we did everything wow. for them. I mean, true primary care. This was family practice at work. We did everything for them. Manage their acute and chronic illnesses, do their preventive exams, all their immunizations. We had a, a comprehensive lab. We had a retail quality pharmacy. We offered nutrition, on-site psychology, as well as physical therapy. And then because that, as a self-funded health plan, when we had someone that needed specialty care, we certainly had no hesitation to refer them to specialists so that they could get that care. But 80 to 90 percent of any problem that came in our door could be taken care of in-house. We did minor office surgery, injected joints, sutured lacerations, removed lesions that didn't look suspicious and things like that. It was a fascinating thing to do. And you are correct that SAS is, has a model that's unlike any other corporations in the country. Our uh, healthcare model is homegrown. We don't. It's not outsourced. It wasn't built by someone else. We built it as the company uh, grew. We grew the healthcare center and the healthcare model. And we've done some research on that model. We did uh, some studies over 10 years. And two of those studies, the phase one and phase two results were actually published in peer reviewed journals. And so we're very proud of that. The evidence showed that uh, offering primary care at work could not only keep people healthier, but could save corporations money. In addition to the to the eight million dollars or so we saved SAS over our expenditures because you know when people came to us they didn't use the health plan. In the long term it saved money and people took fewer drugs, had fewer emergency room visits, and had better controlled chronic illnesses. So we're very proud of that and it's my pleasure to be there for so long. 
Wow, that is really fascinating. I actually learned a lot of interesting things about it. And, you know, I think to add a follow-up question to that, you mentioned that it was not only preventative, improved health, saving corporates money, and probably convenience, you know, from the employee base. What lessons there could be from other companies as they consider about healthcare of their employee base and their dependents? And bigger picture question, how can you bring this type of mentality to the rest of our society? I'm sure all companies have a certain level of concern and investment in their employees. When you have low turnover like SAS did, and you realize that your employees are going to stay with you for the long haul, that many of them come right after college and don't leave until they're in their 70s, they're investing in you as an employer, but you're investing in them and in their health. So if you do not take some kind of steps to ensure that they either can prevent chronic illnesses like hypertension and type 2 diabetes if possible and other things, or at least screen your employees such that you know they have these and they know they have these conditions and they can be treated so that you don't get bad outcomes like strokes and heart attacks and amputations and things like that. When their illness hits and they're the most costly to you and your health plan, they're going to still be with you. Now, there's a lot of good altruistic reasons to do this, but there's a real financial reason to do it too. It's a a business case for investing in your employee's health, particularly if they're going to stay with you long term. Now, if you're an employer that has a high amount of turnover every year and you don't see that as a problem, maybe it just comes with the territory of your work. If you have a third of your employees leaving every year, if you put a lot of investment into their health, you're investing in some of their employees. And so you're not as motivated to do it. And I'll tell you that when you provide the kinds of services that companies like SAS do, you grow a, a mentality among your employees of great loyalty because they go, wow, you're giving me the opportunity to take better care of myself and my family. Why would I want to leave you for just a little bit more money? I can't get this somewhere else. You know, I still saw patients the whole 26 years that I was the chief health officer as well because I wanted to make sure that my decisions, you know, many of which we made as a group, you know, the buck has to stop somewhere. I wanted to make sure my decisions were actually based on reality, what was actually happening in the exam room. And I didn't want that to be data that for me was five or 10 years old. I wanted to be data that like happened that morning. But when you can have that kind of relationship with employees, my patients would say to me, I don't want to retire. And I, I not only love my work, but I can't find health care like this out there. Because this SAS model was, and I'm sure it still is, even though I haven't been there in three years, is that partnered with the folks who licensed SAS software, the relationship led the way. The relationship was very important. Well, that's exactly the same. That was the center of our healthcare model, is that the relationship with our patients led the way to better health care. And so it takes time to develop trust, to learn a lot about your patient, and for them to learn a lot about you and to trust you with their one of their most important things in their life, which is their health and their story about their health. I mean, I could talk about this all day, and I know we have other things to talk no, about. No, that's actually <laughs> fast, fascinating. I think our listeners can learn a lot from that, and I think society as a whole, a lot of other companies can learn from that. I thought one of the most interesting things you said, which made me think, it's not that the turnover of the employee base is just a static thing on its own. It's driven by how the company treats its employee base. And I can imagine that doing things like this keeps people loyal, keeps people there longer. And then you have even more incentive to invest in them. And I will add this, that we're in a tight labor market, as y'all know, and the work that you do and that I see in lots of the work that I do. And when you're in a tight labor market and you're in competition for talent, anything you can do as an employer to make yourself stand out, to make you become an employer of choice. And you can keep your employees there longer because the longer they're with you, the smarter they get, the more contributions they make to you. Then this is a smart thing to do. You don't have to have a, you know, a large operation like SAS did. There's low hanging fruit things you can do uh, to help people uh, invest more in their own health personally if the company will make an investment in their health as well. And so everything doesn't have to be the Tesla model. You can have a good board and still get a lot of bang for your buck doing that. Great. Thanks for sharing. And we, we hope a lot of human resources leaders out there are listening, which I think a lot of people are focusing on. And that'll dovetail into our next topic related to family caregiving and kind of family care responsibilities. How did you see that? You know, we, th- we see this, a lot of HR leaders are starting to talk about 
How did family caregiving fit into the work life department at SAST? What things did the company see with people managing caregiving? Did you see people managing elder care, care for spouses with serious illness? How did they do that, you know, while they were working? So as it wasn't, as it has been since its founding in 1976, SAS is a pioneer in many of these things. And elder care was one of them. And this was a different department from the one that I ran for the um, health care center. But we worked well together because, of course, the folks they helped were also the folks that we worked with. And so we, we worked quite well together collaboratively. And what we, what SAS do and what the, the wonderful folks in the elder care wow. department do, that team of social workers that continue to be so talented and so invested in employees, is that this is an issue, as you know, that continues to grow. We have folks who they're taking care of children often, but they're also taking care of elderly and or chronically ill parents, and they're not always in the same geographic area. They can be in Cary at the global headquarters uh, as a SAS employee, and perhaps their mother or father or even grandmother are, are in Milwaukee. And yet they need to make sure they're getting fed, so they need meals on wheels. Perhaps they need visiting nurses. Perhaps they need some physical therapy. Perhaps they need companion care like your company offers. And when they would come to work and their body was there, but their mind was worried about, is my mother going to fall today? Is my father going to have anything to eat today? Who's going to be with my relative uh, over the weekend because I can't be there? Then we really saw presenteeism or the threat of presenteeism. So by starting the elder care department, these wonderful social workers could help employees navigate what can be something they're totally unfamiliar with. How do you get in touch with Meals on Wheels in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, right? How do you arrange for skilled nursing in San Francisco and even closer to home? How do you choose an assisted living facility or a skilled nursing facility for your spouse or your family member when you do not know how to evaluate what is good versus what is stellar. And they actually not only met with employees and not just the employee, but that employee's family members, because these are family decisions. They're not one person decisions. They affect everyone. They would meet and talk. What is it you're looking for? What's most important to you? And they would develop a list then based on those needs and those desires and what's most valued. They would go and make with the family and make site visits to these uh, nursing homes. This happened in my own family where they helped my father-in-law. And because he was our family, they met with my husband and myself and my father-in-law to do this and went out and visited skilled nursing facilities with my father-in-law and helped him pick one for my mother-in-law that met their needs and made him happy and made her safe. It was a very difficult situation for anybody to be in. SAS believes that if they can help you with things like that, then they will reap the benefit of an employee who comes to work and has their mind fully on their work. And in addition to that, understands what the company has invested in them and that loyalty, it's unshakable. Mm -hmm. And that's the kind of thing that most companies can think about having in-house where they can do it through their employee assistance program. And they can also, you know, things are changing in the world out there. What used to be driving employee recruitment and retention was childcare, right? Here we are 30 years later, and now childcare may not be the issue for, for you as an employee, but elder care is. I'm not saying do one to the exclusion of the other. You have to think on both ends of that age spectrum, right? So that was, that was my experience. Wow. Yeah. Thank you for sharing the perspectives. And also, uh, it's really cool to learn about the services that SAS was offering, including uh, the direct personal experience that you've had. And that's just amazing. You know, we don't hear of many companies doing things like that. And I think you actually alluded to that as one of my next questions, but I think you answered it that we see it as what childcare was 20, 30 years ago when employers realized they needed to start providing some of these structural supports because these were the needs of the employees. You know, we see that now society is starting to age. Looks like we might be at a turning point where many mid-career people are in these situations and many companies are not providing these supports. And I think it's becoming a topic of conversation at HR meetings. So, you know, thanks for sharing. Well, and I'd like to add that I think even though we may feel that many companies aren't providing this, I, I don't mm -hmm. think that's a sign they're unconcerned. I think often you don't know what to do. You want to make sure that you're investing in something that while you can't measure it quantitatively, perhaps, that you 
you get the impression it's actually meeting the need, whether that's mm-hmm. anecdotal or qualitative or whatever. And I think often it's that not knowing how to get started and not knowing what will actually give you the outcome you're looking for, which is employees at work, engaged at work and family safe. And so I, you know, I want to give uh, companies out there the benefit of the doubt that many of them want to do something. They just don't know what to do. Great point. Great point. And, you know, it's nice to get the conversation going because many companies can learn from these examples and start really thinking and, you know, hopefully start supporting these things. So, you know, thanks for sharing. Oh, you're welcome. Then I guess on a similar topic, you know, let's talk about dementia. This is something we see firsthand in many of the people we serve. Over 90% of the people we're helping are suffering from some sort of dementia. Mm -hmm. What we observe is a silent epidemic here that I think we haven't spent as much time as a society talking about what is possibly a pending public health crisis. According to some statistics we've gotten from North Carolina Department of Health and Human Services, we have over 400,000 people in our state. Um, According to federal government statistics, 6 million people across the country have some sort of dementia or cognitive decline. Kind of most difficult of all, DHHS here uh, in our state expects that number to rise by 40 to 50 percent in the next five years. As our society ages, we'll have 600,000 people with dementia. Unfortunately, there's only 100,000 or so caregivers in our state across home care and assisted living. So there won't be enough care unless we somehow 6x the um, workforce. What we observe is people are lacking care. There's caregiver shortages. There's a lot of burden on families to provide the care. Open-ended question, what do you think we as a society and state government can do to begin to address what might be a growing challenge? I think one of the most uh, important words in your question is begin. And I think that conversations have to take place uh, within the legislature, with the governor's office, with the um, certainly with the Department of Health and Human Services and within that public health. I think beginning the conversation is important and to have the data, data like you just mentioned, and to also understand, and I think people do, and that's sometimes what makes them a little nervous to start the conversation, is this is a multifaceted problem. At the same time that we have more people who are diagnosed or recognized to have dementia, we have families that live uh, far apart from each other. We have a a society where you you often don't live in the same town you grow up in. You have people who either don't have children or don't have extended family. So who are those caregivers going to be and who's going to be their advocate, who's going to help them navigate a system, particularly if if the issue is dementia. So I think beginning those conversations are really important. And then to take a look at all the factors that impact not just the number that you have in a workforce, but the skill set of the folks who are in the workforce, because not everyone needs to have a a license like a a nurse or physician. You need a a mix of types of caregivers to to go along with that gross graduated levels of care that people need. And you certainly understand that from the work that Carrie Yaya does, that, that many of the needs are companionship. And it's companionship for safety, but it's also companionship for social support and to help people remain in their homes and have a reason for living. Because those social relationships are hugely important, not just to lower rates of depression and anxiety, which you can have in addition to dementia. You know, when you get dementia, it's not like nothing else happens. You can have dementia and type 2 diabetes, you can have dementia and hypertension, you have dementia and depression or anxiety or panic attacks. I mean, you know, the rest of your body doesn't stop functioning. So looking at how do we shore up our workforce in all kinds of ways and, and how do we as a society think about aging? Because different cultures have a totally different approach to how elders are treated, how they're perceived as contributors to society, how valuable they are. There are all kinds of models out there that show when you take folks that live in nursing homes and you pair them with school children who, you know, spend time together. It benefits the children who begin to understand and have time with older people because maybe they don't have access to their grandparents. But it helps those older people feel still valuable, useful, loved. And it's a win for everybody. So that's a little bit of a scattered answer. But I'll say this. It's a bit of a scattered problem. And so to bring people together who mean well, like policymakers, we mean well. But many of us, many of the 170 legislators that we have, have not been touched by some of these issues yet, although they likely will be. We do that without talking to folks who are living with the problem. So those are the caregivers providing care. Those are the family members. Those are the other folks in the community, faith communities and things like that. You might create a solution that looks so good on paper and just doesn't work. Or it may 
work, but it's too complicated or it may take an incredible amount of transportation. Here's a family that's that has transportation challenges. So I think in addition to beginning the conversation, you have to have the right people in the room and you have to understand this is not a quick fix and that we're not looking for Band-Aid solutions. When you have the numbers that you have given us today, we know that this is a long-term problem. It takes long-term conversations, continuous dialogue, and solutions that are sustainable. Some of them take money and some of them take a change in thinking. Yeah. No, thank you, Senator Adcock. Uh, that was a unbelievably comprehensive answer. And I thought you raised really interesting points about that, that we see and we've uh, read research about. I think the social isolation point alone is fascinating and worth kind of a podcast in and of itself. You know, we've seen the former U.S. Surgeon General doing a big tour right now on social isolation. He wrote a book about it. And being isolated, if you're above 65, it's worse than smoking a pack of cigarettes a day as far as your heart disease risk and risk of premature death. I mean, it's absolutely shocking and heartbreaking statistics that, you know, we see is happening to a lot of older adults in our society. And you're right, there's a lot of structural factors of how families have moved away from each other, um, how mid-career people are so focused on working because they need to make money to make ends meet. So, you know, this is all resulting in worsening isolation. And COVID didn't help, certainly, because a lot of older population had to be isolated. So I think that's a really interesting point that we can solve. And then I, I also just love the point of, that you mentioned about the intergenerational connections. You know, we see this because we're connecting college students to take care of older people in that community. And I think to your point, you know, many of them don't interact with anyone that's above 70 besides maybe their own grandparents. So they can now get shared perspectives from people. And many older people we hear firsthand, they never interact with any 20 year olds. Grandkids might be living somewhere else. So, you know, I think that whether it's college students, school age children, high school, elementary school, even we've seen people in Europe doing daycare and senior care in the same building. I mean, these are just like amazing intergenerational model set. There are builders yeah. in, in parts of this country where they build exactly. intergenerational housing. Mm -hmm. So the yeah. house is larger. It's intended to, yeah. to hold like three generations of folks. And I would just say that having been in local government too, prior yeah. to, to moving to the legislature, and what we see as a, a one of the trends in housing, residential housing, is to build communities for 55 and up. Mm -hmm. So they don't have children around them. Yeah. They are older and, and they're wonderful. I've been to yeah. many of them. They're beautiful. Yeah. And they segregate people. Yeah. So we used to have the trend was more communities. And in your neighborhood, like when I'm in my neighborhood 30 years ago, there were some folks who were retirement age, but there was a big chunk of folks in the middle who were uh, married with young children, right? Mm -hmm. Kids in, you know, preschool or elementary school. And then there were some who came in, didn't have any children and some who retired there. And so you had a mix. And so you would go out in the neighborhood and you would see children of all ages. You'd see families of all kinds. Well, when you live in a 55 and up community, you spend people who the youngest is 55. Yeah. And many of them are quite older. And while that has some goodness to it in terms of, of services and all it doesn't help us with the siloed age kind of situation that we can get into. And yeah, I worry about stuff. Completely agree. And, you know, maybe we'll come up with some innovative solutions like putting a college dorm right next to that 55 plus community, <laughs> or maybe putting a elementary school right next to that community. But you're right. You know, it's well-intended, you know, but unintended consequences. Yeah, community. absolutely. I think yeah. that's absolutely correct. Great. Last question on my end, and then i am turn it over to my colleague, Narana, would be, we see a caregiver shortage that's growing worse. What can we do that would be policies beneficial in supporting caregivers and ensuring we can have an expansion of this workforce? And it feeds now into a healthcare workforce shortage. We're seeing a shortage kind of across the healthcare ecosystem, doctors, um, nurses, social workers. What all can we do, you know, kind of from the low acuity kind of caregiver level all the way to full staffing of hospitals, you know, or, things that you guys think about? What are um, bipartisan approaches that may be gaining traction? Yeah. Yeah. Well, first of all, I appreciate that question. I'd like to say on the front end, there's lots of bipartisan uh, conversation and agreement on the problems. Mm -hmm. And there's even bipartisan agreement on many of the solutions. And again, because we didn't get into this problem overnight, we're not going to solve it overnight. That's a big question that could take not only the remainder of this podcast, but a couple more. So yes, I'm going to hit yes. some highlights that I think perhaps your listeners don't know about. And here's one of them. Last year, a caregiving workforce strategic leadership council was established about this time last year. And its first three focus areas are on direct care, nursing, and behavioral health segments of the workforce. Because we have a workforce issue in, you name the workforce, whether it's HVAC, plumbing, 
teaching everything. So this group is going to be getting together, and it has a very large stakeholder group of partners, the Office of the Governor, the North Carolina Department of Commerce, uh, Health and Human Services, Department of Labor, State Board of Education, Department of Public Instruction, DPI, the North Carolina AHEC Area Health Education Centers, the Community College System, the Independent Colleges and Universities, the UNC System, and the Economic Development Partnership of North Carolina. Wow. And these people, because you think about it, if you just take a peephole view of the problem, you're going to get a peephole solution. So by having this comprehensive group of people meet together and commit to addressing rather than Every single problem on the tree, they're going to take some of the most uh, urgent, low-hanging fruit, if you will, and try to solve that. Because here's what they know. You, you threw some statistics out. I'll throw a couple. Sure. Healthcare and social assistance is the largest industry in North Carolina's economy. It's not agriculture, even though that's wow. huge. Healthcare and social assistance, the largest industry in our economy. And it's projected between now and 2030 to add 76 thousand new jobs wow. out of a projected total new jobs of 445,000. So that's 17% of the, all the new jobs in the next six years are going to be in healthcare and social assistance. So you can see why they chose those issues to deal with first, because when you look at that, you go, oh my gosh, six years is going to go like this. Yeah. We have got to get on this. And of course, that segment of the economy is projected to grow at a higher rate than uh, industries overall. So in addition to that think tank, if you will, to look at the problem comprehensively and look at strategies comprehensively, we have a general assembly who is doing its best to try to increase the pipeline for our healthcare workers, particularly the licensed healthcare workers, and in the budget we just passed in September for the next two fiscal years. I'm going to just tell you a few of the things that were addressed. So one of our biggest workforce challenges, we have a huge projected shortfall in the number of uh, registered nurses and licensed practical nurses we're expected to need between now and 2030. Uh, so they made a large investment, dedicated investment, to faculty salaries in our both community colleges and universities. They increase the loan forgiveness program for a, a wide range of healthcare providers who will go into medically underserved areas and work because even though your heart may be in rural North Carolina, if you come out of a nurse practitioner program or medical school with a huge amount of debt, you've got to be able to make a salary that can pay off that debt. So that's huge. In the nine years that I've been in the General Assembly, we've had bills every session that look at how to become a compact state with adjoining states to shorten the amount of time it can take for someone that's living in another state and has a license as a physical mm -hmm. therapist, a psychologist, a nurse, until they can get their licensure in North Carolina so they can come to work here and, and begin to work faster. One of the things we did in this last budget was to increase the hourly rate for Medicaid for home care nurses and uh, personal care aides at home and in nursing homes, as well as increasing the number of nursing graduates that we have. So those that is skimming the surface of what this General Assembly is trying to do. And we will continue to work on this and chip away at this problem. And we're trying to be as data driven about it as we can. Great. No, thank you for a really comprehensive answer. And, you know, now on that topic, I'll turn it over to my colleague, Narana Tari. She manages a very large and growing free health careers uh, workforce that we manage and are growing rapidly. Over 2,000 students across universities in North Carolina who are intending to pursue careers in nursing, in various aspects of medicine, physical therapy, et cetera. We're kind of like starting to have the conversation and build a relationship with them very early in their journey. Freshmen, sophomore, junior year, kind of inspire them to be community care workers, uh, helping elders with dementia one-on-one. -on -one. But we're also seeing an opportunity to help upskill them and, you know, kind of inspire them to pursue the things they want to pursue. One of the interesting statistics we came across was of people entering North Carolina universities who aspire to be a nurse, nurse practitioner, doctor, from start to finish, only 18% of them end up making it. So we kind of see a big opportunity to build a pathway program to kind of encourage and inspire them. Thanks for joining us, Senator Adcock. Tune into part two, where our colleague Narana Tari will talk about what we can do to inspire young people to pursue careers in the healthcare field.
Thank you for joining Future of Caregiving. Together with Caryaya, we're transforming caregiving through compassion and innovation. Subscribe and join us. And together, let's build a better future for care.